Hi everyone, Kristen DeFrancisco here. I'm actually coming to you from the Gibbs office today. Wednesday is my day to come in and make sure kids have Chromebooks and drop off yearbook covers and all of those good things. So I'm here in my office and I am here to share a little bit with you today about stress and anxiety. That seemed to be what the survey indicated parents wanted to hear most about. Um, it's actually one of the topics I like talking the most about because I think that um, we need to understand what's going on for, for children and anybody really around what's happening when stress and anxiety enters the picture. And that's certainly no one is a stranger to that right now. We're all feeling stress and anxiety for sure. So I put together a little bit of a slideshow for us to take a look at. I was careful not to go too deep into the science because I don't think that you really need to hear it deeply at what I think you need to do is just have an understanding of what's actually going on in the brain when stress and anxiety enter the picture. And so we ask that question, what happens in our brains when we are stressed or anxious? So the parts of the brain that we'll talk a little bit about but very briefly, and I don't claim to be a neuroscientist, but I certainly spend some time thinking about what is actually going on in the brain when I'm, when I'm interacting with students that are having a tough time. So we'll talk about two of those parts. The first is the prefrontal cortex, and the second is the amygdala. And what I want you to think about as we're going through this is your fist. And so your fist, if you make a closed fist and you tuck your thumb inside of your closed fist, that is what we're gonna use as our visual of the brain. That prefrontal cortex is the frontal lobes of the cerebrum. And so it is, it is actually the newest part of the brain in terms of scientific study. Um, we have, they have the least information about it. But what we do know about the free prefrontal cortex is that it does a lot of important things for us as we're thinking through and making decisions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, actually, right now, it is responsible for most of our executive functioning. That includes long-term planning, understanding rules, calculating consequences for risk and reward, regulating emotions, problem solving, and decision making. Lots of important things go on in the prefrontal cortex. And you'll, you'll, you've heard me talk about how kids are rewiring their brain right now at the sixth grade level. Um, and that is what's being rewired and kind of worked to, to work more efficiently. And so that prefrontal cortex, there's a lot of going, a lot, a lot of things going on in there for kids right now. What does the amygdala do? Well, we're thinking about our fist again. The amygdala is the thumb that you tucked inside of the prefrontal cortex. It is in charge of our fight or in flight. So it kicks in when we need to make a decision about running away from something or staying and fighting. And if you watch my behavior has a reason vlog, you remember that one of the things that kids do, part of their behavior is either um, escape or avoidance. And this might be that their amygdala is at work. Um, and sh that behavior might be showing you that their uh, amygdala is, is kind of taken over. We call it an amygdala hijack. So under normal circumstances, we activate this part of the brain, the amygdala, to keep ourselves safe from something that's a threat. The part of the brain though, doesn't necessarily know if it's really a threat or we're just feeling threatened. Um, and that's an important distinction to make because we certainly want the amygdala to work when there's actually a threat. So we can decide what to do in the moment, which is all the brain is concerned about at that point. But that doesn't mean that the amygdala sometimes doesn't butt its head in where it doesn't belong. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So we've got the prefrontal cortex, which is your fist, and the amygdala, which is tucked inside of it. So enter stress and anxiety, what happens? So you're imagining that your brain is that fist and your thumb is tucked inside, your fingers and knuckles and fist are the prefrontal cortex. They're humming along, making good decisions. They're keeping a lid on the amygdala, which is that thumb. And then, uh-oh, some sort of anxiety enters the scene and you flip your lid. Open up your hand, put your fingers straight up in the air and you've exposed the amygdala completely. So in doing so, you've also robbed yourself of the ability to do all of those good things the prefrontal cortex does. Your self-control has gone out the window. Your good decision-making, gone. All your brain is trying to decide whether to do is should I fight and stay or should I flee and go and run away? 
You've left it completely out. Your amygdala has been hijacked. That it is, rather, your amygdala is hijacking your brain. It's taking over there. So if you're looking at this through a sixth grade lens, when we're thinking specifically about sixth graders and where they are, you've often heard me say that frontal lobes at the stage or at the game of the game are being rewired. So not only are sixth graders dealing with a rewire of their um, frontal prefrontal cortex, during a lid flip, it's even more difficult to make decisions. Um, because even if they had any chance of accessing that self-control, remember that self-control is still being worked on and rewired. So you're going to see um, maybe even more of a larger reaction during a lid flip of a sixth grader at this developmental phase. Enter COVID-19 and remote learning. Under normal circumstances, we're, we're helping sixth graders identify what causes anxiety, or stress during this transitional time, like participating in class might be hard for kids or making friends, managing schoolwork and homework, et cetera. So now we've asked them to change the way they do school entirely, which could mean that even though we were already probably seeing some lid flipping, now we're probably seeing more lid flipping. And there is a reason for that. Uh, you know, students are, or kids at home and, and families are picking up on stressors, you know, from us as grownups, from siblings and, you know, not knowing maybe how to deal with that, they're flipping their lids. So being proactive about a flipped lid, what can you do? If your sixth grader or anyone really has flipped their lid, here are some things you can have in place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I talked about in the other vlogs that I that I, I shared with you. And, and hopefully you can try these things. Um, I think being proactive and really talking with your your family and your your sixth grader specifically, but everyone in your family about what it means to take time and space, some strategies for what what you should do when when a lid appears to be flipped or is going to flip. Um, and the first is that time and space, having a place to suggest that a person from your family go when it looks like they've flipped their lid is really important. And having things inside that space that are going to help them get to a calmer space and close the lid and put the prefrontal cortex back in charge is important. Um, so really setting up that time and space, and you can certainly um, watch and learn a little bit more about that in the video about behavior has a reason. Um, change the channel, which I actually didn't mention in any of my other videos. Um, changing the channel might be language you use like a remote control. I'm gonna change the channel for a moment. I'm gonna think about something else. I'm gonna give my, my lid, my prefrontal cortex, a chance to put itself back over the amygdala, and then I can have a chance to talk about this. So it's not a stop and a don't, and we won't be revisiting this. It's more of a pause and a switch, and we're gonna talk about this when you're in a calmer place. Cognitive breaks are also really important, and a cognitive break is just different from free time or from drawing or from chilling out. It actually is changing the, it is actually reactivating that prefrontal cortex. It could be working a Rubik's Cube. It could be doing a Mad Lib. Um, it could be doing a Stoku. It could be um, something that really gets your brain out of the mode that it's in and forces the prefrontal cortex to enter back into the picture and start working again. And then once you've gotten that lid back on the amygdala, you can you can get back into, okay, what happened? How was your body feeling? Why do you think you felt that way? That cognitive break is really important. And if, for some kids, they really do just need to be built into a day proactively. So you, you can be thinking about how you might build in some cognitive breaks that work for your children and your people in your family. And then the power of your words. When the prefrontal cortex has flipped its lid, what you say as an observer or as the grown-up in the situation can either make it go further left, like throwing gasoline on the fire, or it can take it to a place where, where you're going to be able to re-enter the situation and do some reflection. We talk about how we phrase our words all the time at school. Um, you know, things like, you look like you might be having a hard time right now. Please go take some time and space. Uh, it isn't a choice. It is something you're asking them to do. Or the stress doesn't need to win, but in the moment you can't make a decision right now. We're going to wait to make our decision. I'm going to give you time and space. So really, be. I need to know what your plan is. Can you tell me what your plan is? The, using those kinds of words as opposed to stop acting that way and you're being ridiculous and you know this isn't acceptable behavior. Remember that they don't have the prefrontal cortex 
to help them understand what you're saying. All they know right now is that they're deciding whether or not to flee the situation or to fight with you. So you can de-escalate that by just remembering that they're not in a space to negotiate and that they really do need to change the channel, have a cognitive break, or take time and space. Not quite flipped. This is one of the most proactive things you can do. Help yourself and your children realize what flips their lids, like what flips your lid, what flips your child's lid. Um, how does your body feel when that's happening? Because what will start to happen then is you'll actually give your children the skill to detect a lid flip. I feel like I am going to flip my lid. I'm, out, I'm sweaty, I'm hot, my, my insides are shaky, I'm getting angry, I can't think, I need time and space, I need a cognitive break, I need to um, change the channel. And so you, your children might not be able to do that on their own right away, but if you come up with a signal um, before that lid gets put so that you can get that lid back on, you know, coming up with a signal would really be helpful. And sometimes people use that, what they use for that signal is, is that the fingers are coming up over the thumb a little bit in that fist, but they're not quite all the way standing up straight. And that signal, that visual signal might help children reset and understand that they need a little something right now in order to do a better job with processing or returning to the situation. So remember, I'll show it to you now that you can see me. You know, this is this is the the brain and this is the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is hiding inside there. And when a child has flipped their lid, that amygdala comes out and becomes the most prominent part. You know, it, it's, it's taken over, it's taken a, char a charge, it's hijacked all of the self-control so that getting that lid to come back down might take a little bit of work but if it's halfway there, you might be able to close it a little bit quicker. So I think these images are helpful to explain to your child what's going on in their brain. It's probably not the first time they've heard it. They might have actually heard it here at Gibbs School, I'm hoping. Um, but a nice way to sort of have an entry point. Um, you certainly can show them this video if you feel like that would be helpful. Um, but coming up with some of those visuals uh, and some strategies for when a lid does get flipped and it happens. Um, in addition to that, just I'd, I, I'd like to remind you about self-care and to, to be thinking about how you're taking care of your own self so that when there is a lid flip in your family, you feel like you're in a space and, and in a place where, where you can be helpful. So I hope this help was helpful for you. I thank you for joining uh, me as I talked a little bit about anxiety and stress. Certainly open to any questions via email if you have them. Continue to have a wonderful week, and I will see you at Sunday Greetings.